wanna... You beat me to it. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining this morning with our advocacy work group. Um, today, we promise we're gonna get to the work plans and together start crafting some action steps. I know we keep, um, so that's a, a goal and an objective today and, and we're gonna, we'll get to it. So that's pretty much the, the bulk of the agenda. Um, before we dive in, let's see if everyone could put their name and affiliation in the chat, please. And we'll say, you can add it to the chat or you could say it now that kind of um, spring is, it's officially spring. It might not feel like spring outside your, your window, but what's something you're looking forward to kind of in, as spring is on the horizon with warmer weather? Um, and as we're doing that, I'll just kind of put it out there to the group. If anybody has any updates they want to share, um, any news, kind of the thought is just to spend a little time, we'll give you an update on what the other work groups are, have been doing, um, some, some to do's around week of the young child, but also, but before that, if there's anything that's on your kind of radar that you want to share with the group, we'd love to kind of open it up to all of you to, to share and reflect. The new snow is going to melt the old snow. I like that. That's that must be like a global warming thing. Seeds, yeah. I always remember like watching the tulips pop up, and then like the next day they'd be gone because the deer had found them. But for that one day, it was great to see them. Amy, I'm down to the last couple inches of snow. How much do you still have? Depends on where you are, but in the field, there's like on the edge of the field, there's several feet. But that's it's sugar season, so it's okay if it melts slowly. So yeah. this, these are the big flakes, the big spring poor man's fertilizer flakes. So yeah. And, and Tammy, again, screen is off, and I agree. Getting kids outside and having less, taking less time to layer them up to get them out there is a big time saver. Great. Well, I appreciate everybody um, commenting in the chat. And so if there's any anything you want to share with the group right now, any updates, reflections, anything that can should be on our radar? Kind of as our advocacy work comes into shape. Sure. I'll, um, hi, good morning. Just, um, you might have received Jake Berry's um, advocacy alert yesterday, but just in case you didn't, um, from New Futures, uh, Senate Bill 416 passed by vo voice vote, um, and New Futures supports this bill, which would um, aid children with behavioral health needs by requiring an evidence-based behavioral health analysis or assessment before children are placed in institutional or out-of-home settings. Um, and now it's going to head over to the House. The um, Senate Bill 453 was defeated. Uh, we supported this bill, but um, which would have helped improve the education and well-being of children and working families. By, re by requiring public school districts to provide pre-kindergarten programs. So um, in other news, the uh, House and Human Service Committee voted on Wednesday to support an amended uh, version of Senate Bill 288, which now proposes to create a study committee to look into immunizations for children. The bill will go to a vote on the Senate floor next Thursday. And that's it for now. It's been a busy week. Thanks, Janet. Are there any bills kind of on the horizon? That... I don't. I don't know. I'll know later on today what, okay. what the bills are and can send folks the updates. Great. Yeah. Just keep us in the loop. Appreciate it. 
any other updates you want to share with the group? All right. Well, if, if you think of something, feel free to. to uh, I can a couple of things. Great. Um, I, I, I wanted to just update our um, week of the young child. We are um, just trying to get the rest of our yard signs out. And we also um, are going to be sending out a bunch of buttons. It's that button that says I'm at work because of my essential early educator, um, or I think we had an early childhood education provider. Um, and we also were talking about, and we haven't talked about this in the steering committee, about using that background, <laughs> especially um, for the week of the young child, if everybody, and I had actually talked to Jackie Cowell last night about if we could use it statewide, because Emily said it was okay. Um, to use that background statewide so she would pass it on to their corporate partners and see if they would also use it in zoom meetings and just put that you know without adding the logo not branding it just that um, if we could start using it for it would be the first week in April so if you just started April 1st for the first week that would be great I know I attend a lot of zoom meetings and it would be great to have that <laughs> Background. That's something we can send out to the group. I know Emily Tenenbaum from Let's Grow Kids kind of sent a bunch of um, collateral for a week of the young child, but we can kind of pull that. I know I picked that one because it didn't have Let's Grow Kids and I can use it on Zoom calls here in, in Texas. Um, so we'll send that to everybody and that'd be great to, to get that. So for the first week of April, that, that's the goal to have that as your background. It would be great if we could do, could do it statewide too. Yeah. So we're going to be a statewide partner. So I don't know if New Futures is able to do anything like that, um, but we're going to push it out through Early Learning New Hampshire to all the providers and all of our partners that way. Um, and then I, we can announce that <laughs> they announced yesterday that um, all the providers in New Hampshire are having access to the CELA website, which is a shared um, early learning um services website which is something that our recruitment group will be looking at because there's a recruitment tool on there we need to access and um other thing for the advocacy oh i just wanted to mention that the program models group uh, facilities and program models group is looking at seeing if we can come up with um some sort of you know, shovel ready, comprehensive plan for this, for this, um, for this region for future funding. We don't have anything packaged to give, uh, to, to apply for anything. And we've been notified of different funding opportunities coming down the line. And so I think we're all going to need to give a heads up and make sure that we're ready for other funding opportunities. So there's some congressional, congressional, like I think level spending um, for community projects. Um, we talked the other day informally, um, Sean and Jen Parker and I about um, access and facilities. And he was talking about land that towns have that they could be using or even, um, or even uh, buildings. So we have centers that are in that are paying for a space where they we could be partnering with a public school space or with um, a facility space and within the community. So if we can start some sort of formal process of putting together a package for future use, that would be great. Kind of like a checklist of wants so that we can figure out what funding kind of fits into the plan. Great. And that kind of corresponds with opportunities with discretionary ARPA funding, right? I mean, we're a little, we, we missed some opportunities there, but to get our ducks in a row. So if there are, if there are kind of 
new waves of ARPA funding or whatever kind of relief funding and kind of in that same vein. And Julia, I wanted to connect with you on this. I know Sean uh, Moholland, who's the city administrator for Lebanon is, is looking at ways that the city of Lebanon can direct ARPA dollars towards childcare relief. And just kind of putting that in the ethos of other town and city administrators. So, and even kind of with the county, because I know counties have a lot of discretionary dollars. Um, more so, I think in New Hampshire than in Vermont, it sounds like a lot of Vermont dollars have already been allocated or um, uh, directed to specific use. But, but the more we can kind of put it on the radar of those decision makers. And I know Tammy had worked in, in her community with the select the Board of Selectmen and women. Um, so just opportunities there to, so if we have that kind of punch list, we can say like, look, these are the needs, you have the funds, um, the more we can. And, and I know, Brooke, one of the things <clears throat> I've been sort of um, waiting to assess is that the, the work-life balance task force that's active on the Dar Dartmouth campus, um, and I've talked with a subset of the task force, primarily about housing, workforce housing, but it it dovetailed into a conversation about the lack of childcare. Um, and I've said, look, I I want to I want to see what recommendations this task force comes up with because so many of the Dartmouth faculty and staff live in our community, right? So they they're very representative of what our community is facing. And, and I've said to the board, they should be prepared to consider providing some funding, particularly if it would be matching what Dartmouth might do. Um, and that our ARPA money, we, we will, by the end of August, have received 1.2 million, our total allocation. And we haven't made decisions about expending any of that money yet for the, for the express purpose of sort of sitting on that egg for a while before we hatch it, because we, we want to be strategic and not just sort of throw money um, blindly at stuff that may be less important when we can really um, move the needle with something strategic. That's great. And one thought we had was if it helps to have this, the vital communities, the EC, the kind of the steering committee, write a letter of support to the town administrators, um, town and city administrators saying that we are supportive of allocating ARPA funds towards early childhood education needs or the, the child care kind of to help alleviate the child care credit, whatever kind of the nuance of the language is, but letting right. them know that there's greater support than um, out there and some kind of political backing. Well, and I think what would be most helpful, Brooke, if there were, if the task force came up with a sub, with a, with a focused group of initiatives um, that that we could, as communities, be asked to support financially allocating a, a portion of our ARPA money collectively. I think there's more there's strength in numbers, both in terms of community contributions, but also in in helping to focus the funded projects that that requests are submitted for. Um, and so, uh, one of the things. The, the advocacy group and the overall task force could really focus on, particularly as the legislative session sort of wind down and we get a little bit of bandwidth here, to what, what would move the needle? Um, is it staffing for ongoing advocacy? Is it funding for um, child care staff salary? Um, you know, increases, is it resource funding? What is it? And if Enfield, Hanover, Canaan, Lebanon, all the communities in this, on this side of the river, plus our Norwich um, colleagues could come together to jointly fund something, it's gonna be harder for, for an individual community to say no when their surrounding fellow communities are saying yes. Um, so, uh, you know, I once again, I'm I'm a relative short timer in this role. Done sometime this summer, depending upon when my successor is ready to start. So I, I'm I feel a little bit frustrated because I can't I can't 
commit the way I could if I weren't going to retire. But I, I think I've tried the prime, to prime the pump with my select board to say, look, this is a critical opportunity. I really want to see what the Dartmouth Work-Life Balance Group comes up with in terms of identifying the need and strategies that they're going to take to Dartmouth, because then we can partner with Dartmouth to try and move the needle. Uh, I, that's great. That's really helpful, Julie. I appreciate that that framing of it, and I think that's a. So, Amy, we can kind of circle back at with the steering committee and kind of work with the the facilities work groups and and put together kind of an outline of what some requests would be. And I, I like kind of framing it like here. Here's kind of a package. Right. Um, yeah. As a, as opposed to kind of disjointed ask within each community. Right, and, and I, what I, I and, sure. go ahead, Andrew. I was just going to make the connection that um, Sunny McFetris is now a member of the Cowley group at Dartmouth and is has been given um, the authority to take recommendations from the ECE initiative participants on what we thought to do. So there's a very clear line of you know, chain of command there that we, we have a direct linkage to um, at this point. So I really like your idea, Julia, of like having having the kind of, you know, like a here's some very concrete suggestions for how you could, I mean, we could do the same kind of a thing for for the Cowley group, um, as far as I understand. So. Yep, and 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 that I think in large part goes back to the work that Erica and and her um, colleagues did in getting 350 names of Dartmouth personnel together to say to the administration, this matters. Um, the other thing I would add to Julia's is that um, in New Hampshire, there's also county money. And I'm not sure that Grafton and Sullivan counties have allocated um, all of their money yet. My perception was they had not. Um, and so that's another um, collaborative or you know cross town um, source of money in Vermont. What happened was um, um, the um, administration divided up the county money among the towns. In fact, many of the tiny towns ended up with more county money than actual municipal money. But so in in Vermont, there's not that second tier. It's already been. Um, Allocated. Yep. Yeah. And Sarah, the person to talk with on the county would be Wendy Piper, who's our county commissioner from from the lower southern the southern Grafton County portion and lives in Enfield. Um, just to tap into Wendy, because I, I've not I mean, my my initial reaction is the county got a lot of money in New Hampshire County's got a lot of money because counties nationwide received a lot of ARPA money, even though New Hampshire counties as counties go, don't do much um, in terms of comprehensive county services. So a lot of us sort of went, oh, great, just what they need, more money than they know what to do with. But um, so I have not tracked really closely what decisions they've made about allocating or utilizing their ARPA money. Wendy Piper would be the person to connect with. And I, I can certainly send that query and copy the the group just to kind of start that dialogue if that would be helpful that would be fabulous if you could do that julia okay. and then um i can pay some attention to keeping track of that once you get that conversation open okay we'll do and then thank you and then the kind of the one last um item around municipalities is that again sean and lebanon is looking to get language put forth language to the New Hampshire Municipal, Municipal Association to, um, around childcare as part of their kind of policy agenda so that down the road, as they are able to kind of designate where funds are allocated, childcare kind of falls into that broad overview um, and kind of framing as an economic development piece. So we're working with Sean to kind of parse out that language, um, but I'll, I may circle back with you, Julia. And again, it's kind of a strategy about how we get other 
town and city administrators on board with this before it goes to the whole municipal association. And Brooke, the significance of the timing right now is that the New Hampshire Municipal Association, NHMA, is starting its legislative policy planning process for the next biennium right now. They're yeah. seeking committee members. Sean's active in that process. So they will be working from April through August in developing the legislative priorities for New Hampshire cities and towns. And then they have a legislative policy conference in September where all the NHMA members come together and vote yay or nay on recommended priorities. So that's, you know, this is a fruitful time to be inserting this conversation into that conversation. Yeah, knowing that it's kind of for future um, strategy, but again, you know, how the advocacy work group and our networks can then kind of express support of that, getting the business coalition to express support to kind of give some more political coverage to the towns um, and the, the municipal association to include child can really frame it as a workforce issue, economic development issue. Well, and right now all the managers who speak regularly on a statewide listserv are scrambling because they're really worried they're not gonna be able to find enough staff to run their summer camp programs, which are essentially summer childcare <laughs> programs for many working families. So trust me, <laughs> They and their recreation departments are right smack in the middle of this same challenge, just as our child care professionals are. Great. Great. Okay. Um, all right. So I think that the, any other updates from the other work groups, retention, recruitment, retention facilities that we didn't cover? That would be helpful for this group to have. Okay. Um, kind of moving on. Week of the Young Child, we touched on it with our virtual backgrounds. Amy, um, you mentioned yard signs and buttons. How can how can this group this and our advocacy kind of listserv? How can we help spread the word? What are some marching orders or things we can do to to create awareness next week. I think we have the, I think we have the um, flyer pretty much done. Um, and we will be distributing the buttons through the centers. The centers will distribute them to their parents uh, like we did last year. Um, I think last year we distributed 1800 buttons. So we're hoping that people kept them. <laughs> and we'll be reusing them and then our yard signs um, will be going most of our centers already have them so they'll be reusing them and then we'll be sending out new ones um, one of the things that we didn't have a connection to was they had started to talk about um, just in general kind of leveling the playing field for um, elementary educators are cheap certified teachers in public school and early childhood teachers and wanted to see if there's any way to get them recognized. And one of the things that they thought of is like having a card, it would be an ECEA card, like membership card. And that would get them, like if, if they were a staff member, it'd only be good for a year or something. It'd get them a discount equally to where teachers get discounts. And one of the things specifically was, could we get a discount on a certain day or something to monitor? And um, they just felt it was a good way to kind of connect with um, the museum, but also kind of bring, have an outing with their own family. And they, most of them have children. So I thought, well, I'll just put it out there and see what we can come up with. But that was one specific. And then they were sending me a list like Michael's and um, you know, Joanne's fabrics and things like that. And, mo and you know, what the worst part is, is most of these teachers spend their own money to buy materials, even for their, their early childhood classrooms. Um, and then the other thing I was thinking that they thought of, this is the R3 committee for, this is our recruitment retention recognition staff committee. These are staff of childcare centers, is they really wanted to make an early childhood presence <coughs> at, um, Add heroes event in October. 
rep and representing as a as a group representing early childhood. So that was something they also wanted to kind of put out there. And then I was thinking Erica's background make a cool cape. So just to just to tag on to that the, the recruitment retention work group was talking a lot about how ECE provides um, some are not as excited about getting spa, you know, gift certificates and more excited about having gas cards. Um, that like basic, basic needs um, getting met is, is kind of important. So that was another thing we were looking at too, um, to just support folks in the field. Can I chime in? Hi everybody, my name is Deli Champagne and I work for Save the Children. I'm a new employee there, so we're eager and excited to revitalize the work we've been doing. I believe my predecessor has not been in, in the role for like five months, so I wanna bring us back. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I wanna be a part of your group. I wanna assist in any way that I can. And I want to um, let you know that I just found out yesterday I have <laughs> $50 uh, woo, um, to give toward, we were thinking of doing something on May 6th, the actual, um, you know, child care day, awareness day, um, but I'm happy to donate my $50 to gas cards if you think that makes sense. Um, and I also want to let you know, we're planning a film screening, um, the um, starting at zero, which talks about parity and pay. I know Amy's gonna be on my um, ad hoc committee. If anybody else wants to join that committee, we're meeting Monday for the first time. We do have the um, film for free and uh, we're in direct contact with the director. So that'll be um, an exciting project that hopefully you guys will wanna be a part of. Um, and I also wanted to let you know, we probably, this is still in the works, but we are probably gonna do a community conversations um, initiative in the fall with uh, our um, new and upcoming legislators that are running for office. Um, and we're going to highlight um, ECE and get them on the record of, of talking about what their priorities are. Um, and if you want to partner, I'm going to be partnering with Jackie Cowell on that one. But if you want to, you know, sit on that ad hoc committee too, I'd love to have you. So I just want to let you know, Save the Children is back. We're back strong. We're alive and well. We want to support your work and anything I can do, please let me know. Thanks, Sally. That's, in, that's encouraging. And let us know with the starting from zero, is the thought that's going to be an in-person event or a virtual screening? So we have our first meeting on Monday. So here's what I would actually like to do. Uh, I don't know if any of you ever saw the movie Trey Mason de Son. So when I was with New Futures, I partnered with the Department of Corrections and we showed a movie around the state Trey Mason de Son of the names of the three boys who all had an incarcerated parent. And we showed that 12 times in two years around the state, in person, virtual. And as a result of that, we were able to get the Department of Education on board. We created a toolkit for teachers because that's what we were hearing at these events, that teachers don't know how to support kids who have an incarcerated parent. So we created a toolkit. We are the first in the nation to have a toolkit for teachers on the website. And we were actually recognized at a conference in Washington DC last week that New Hampshire is the only state in the country that has taken this further. So I would love to see us take this movie and show it around the state, not just one time, uh, probably not 12 times, but we do have it for free. So that's exciting. So, and we also have, I don't know if you guys know about the movie, um, but it was the governor of Alabama go figure, right, Alabama, that really changed things around, changed the narrative and said, you know what, we are going to pay our early childhood ed teachers the same thing that we pay our public school teachers. So that you were like the first state in the nation to do this. And this is what the film is about. So we have some, so we can have the director on our panel. We can also have someone from the governor's office in Alabama has also agreed to be on the panel to talk about how that change happened. 
and those are free people that we don't have to pay for. Plus I have um, a budget for this. So um, just kind of want to get you excited and on board and hopefully we can do this, you know, maybe take a whole year to do it and just show it around the state, but really highlight the need to let's talk about, and I love Erica's background, um, that, you know, it is essential. And if you want good childcare workers, you have to pay them, you know, and it doesn't just talk about that, it talks about other things too, but I like getting to the root of let's, let's really talk about what's going on here. And that movie does that. So hope that answered your question. Long-winded, sorry. No, that's exciting. That's great. Yeah, keep us involved and we're, we're grateful to have you as part of this conversation. Um, okay, one last thing we're doing around Week of the Young Child is the Barrel Communities ECE Steering Committee is drafting an op-ed um, for the local media just to highlight highlight the work thus far, um, bring again, bring attention to the issue and um, hopefully kind of offer some suggestions about where, where the work is moving. So kind of be on the, the lookout for that. So I have a question. I, um, are these, um, I see the great letter, uh, the, the proclamation that's uh, about the proclamation in Vermont. Is there anything happening on, on the other side, on the New Hampshire side related to that? Something, anything similar? Good question. I do not know. And um, is this campaign, so this, the week, is it celebrated? It, I just want to make sure that the focus is a just Vermont. It's a national celebration. So what are New Hampshire folks doing? Do you know related to this? Is there any collaboration? Yeah. We don't we don't have a chapter of NAUIC anymore. It it may be circling back again, but right now we don't. And Vermont has a very strong chapter of um, NAUIC. So oh, I see. Yeah. So and, and it tends to be it used to be just accredited centers that would always we would always we're really big on Week of the Young Child. And then we started to expand it out. It was mostly those state chapters that did that work. Um, but in New Hampshire, we haven't really pulled it together. <laughs> did you say, uh, New does New Hampshire have a chapter or not? Did not you say anymore, but it's coming from what I understand, we, they gave it back and then, um, and now they're reviving it. So, but not in time for the week of the young child. So we, the answer is no, that I, not that I know of, but there are pockets of groups that do things for the week of the young child. So the graphics are just beautiful. The, the um, things that were, that were sent out in the email there, are those local children and providers? Yeah, so the, the flyer was created by, um, it, the idea came from the ECEA and then our vital communities communications folks took it and did their magic on it graphically. And um, those pictures are from our kids from the DH um, uh, Child Care Center that they shared with us for promotional purposes, so. so. So frequently new futures will use our social media to share these kinds of um, activities, events. So I'm just wondering how, what the connection is here in New Hampshire, if we were to do that, if, if you have collaborated with folks in New Hampshire around that, the week. I think the connections are TBD. Okay. So I'm understanding you can go ahead and make those connections. I, I shared those, the flyer and those two social media pieces because they're for anybody in the community to use to say, hey, week of the young child, this is a big deal. Let's talk about ECE workforce importance of early childhood, et cetera. Cool, okay. Feel free so, to use them, yeah. so is what we're surfacing right now that there is no coordinated Week of the Young Child communication strategy in the state of New Hampshire, that none of the groups have taken this on as, um, as a task? Is that what we're learning right now? And if so- That's what I'm asking, Sarah, yeah. Okay, does, so does anybody, I mean, so we've got you who have a statewide um, perspective and Delhi who's got a statewide perspective. 
Um, Amy, you sit at many other tables too. Does anybody know if there is, are any of the groups, uh, Michael, you're at a number of those tables too. Um, is anybody doing what um, <clears throat> NAYC is um, and Let's Grow Kids in Vermont? Is anybody doing it in New Hampshire? There's lots of pockets, like Coas County does it and the ECA has been doing it. There are lots of pockets all over the place and accredited centers usually do it. But, you know, this isn't a bad thing for the PDG to take on if we're going to do region and make sure we, co we are covering the state. I wonder if the, the PDG regions could take that on, at least until any NHAYC chapter gets established. So are all of you familiar with what Amy is referencing when she talks about the, the PDG region? No. Okay. So right now there is a pot of federal money, it's always federal money in New Hampshire um, that um, is called the, the Preschool Development Grant. Um, and what the state did was decide to divide it up into, um, divide the state into seven regions. And for those of you who followed the, um, the, the regional structure of the, the big substance um, misuse and the substance mental health medical home connection work that went on for about five years. It's basically the same kind of regions. We are part of region one, which um, includes what we know as the general upper valley um, and um, Claremont, Newport area, and then all the way down through the Monadnock area to the Massachusetts border. And the money is being used for an infrastructure to try to do some kind of coordinated early childhood system for the region. And a number of people um, um, in this group here sit on one or another of the kinds of um, work groups that are related to that. Um, there's a second pot of um, action money that's related to training people to be coaches um, in evidence-based models of working with children. Um, but the, the and, and as it happens, the, um, all of the regions are gonna be coming together in a meeting next week for the first time. Um, and maybe if we can, can get something um, to our Region One leadership people who are based in Keene, they're part of Impact Monadnock. Um, that, that's where our leadership for this is. Um, that would be um, a useful pathway to follow. It's cutting timing pretty close, but on the other hand, it looks like most of anything that would be needed has already been developed. It's just a matter of getting it out there, the same stuff with one voice. And, and so um, that, because I am one of the people that's sitting on that region one group, um, I can um, take on a push about that um, later today. Thank you, Sarah, for that explanation. And let me know how I can help on this side of the borderline. Great. And by the way, anytime I explain something, when I muck it up, if somebody would straighten it out, that would be great. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Yeah. And any way we can get a presence in the Capitol building as well, I think would be um, so just something to think about in New Hampshire, highlighting for the legislature. Do you know when um, Governor Scott's doing the proclamation? Do you have a date yet? I don't know. I yeah. just have a general question. Does New Hampshire have a child care day at the legislature like Vermont does? I just don't know. I don't know. I, I think it's safe to say that Vermont is light years ahead of New Hampshire, guys. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I listen to this and I just go, yeah, so what else is new? Um, 
Yeah. I'm just trying to learn what what exists right. where. <laughs> right. So. It's, it's sad. I mean, it's really it's sort of symptomatic of of the makeup of our legislature, quite frankly. Um, pretty out of touch with this aspect of our communities. And you know, I think part of that is is that we don't have a strong chapter of of NAUIC. Mm -hmm. We don't have a Let's Grow Kids. So they're not going to know. I don't know. So right. there's no coordinated communication system. So, but it would be, you know, I've been a member of the Vermont chapter of NAUIC because it's just been more organized and, and stronger than the New Hampshire chapter. So we really need to get New Hampshire up and running and um, and then really kind of get these, if we're going to have these co uh, these regional coalitions, there's seven, the state is divided up into seven um, regions. If we're going to get these regional coalitions up and going, um, they have to be part of the coordination of all of the other systems if we're gonna be relying on them. So there's, there's just a lot of structural work that needs to happen in order to make sure everybody knows what's going on. So uh, for, I Again, I was just asking that because I find the the pandemic really helped to in having the child care day at the legislature because in the past I couldn't take off a half a day and go to it, but now it's done virtually, so I get to participate in that. And then the whole lunch with the legislatures, where you're sitting at the table with you know two or three of them and discussing these things is I think really powerful because they get to hear it, not just in briefs that they get or press releases that they get, but they get to put like a face to what it really means. So it was just something that I wondered whether or not that happens. I'm sad to hear that that's not happening yet in New Hampshire, but you know, maybe one day, at least you have resources and connections to draw from what's already being done in other places to be able to help build that. So for the folks that are representing New Hampshire here, I don't know who, who you may be, but do you also connect on a statewide level? Do you have a statewide umbrella for ECE? I think that would be Sarah Fox. Yeah, she's the one that oversees the PDG um, and she um, takes care of the, the Alliance. Um, I think she would be a good place to start. Yeah, but Janet, if you're asking more about an advocacy umbrella, that wouldn't be Sarah Fox, but um, so no, there, I, there is not kind of the equivalent of a Let's Grow Kids in New Hampshire that's solely focused on ECE advocacy. There's there's departments I think that do that do cross state um, collaboration. So like Child Care Aware is they, they collaborate. The um, State Early Learning Alliances collaborate. So there's there's different departments or levels that do regional like regional, like state across state lines, but there's nothing um, like early childhood specific to something early childhood specific. It, that's, I, it's not what you're thinking, Janet, there is, doesn't exist, but there's yeah. pieces that, there's pieces right. that. <laughs> well, so I don't mean to jump ahead, but I was looking at the work plans and I was thinking, uh, you know, how do, do the work plans and the goals and the action steps integrate with what's happening with other uh, like same like agencies and providers in New Hampshire? So I'm jumping the gun here, but yeah. I'm no, trying to get a better no, a I, picture. I, I appreciate you saying that because what I'm learning from this conversation is as much as in Vermont, we tend to think that our system is somewhat fragmented in that some of it lives with agency of health and services and some of it lives in the agency of education and then you have CDD and all these different elements. It sounds like the fragmentation in New Hampshire is a little bit more extensive than that. And that, it, like you said, we at least have like Let's Grow Kids to kind of 
go to and try to have coordinated efforts across the state. Um, and I just wonder what it took for, because I wasn't around in Vermont when Let's Grow Kids started. Money. So I'm just wondering what happened to they had tons make that. Of money. Yeah. yeah, they they had just tons and tons of money to start Let's Grow Kids. But it's just, I guess the reason that that happens is the priority somehow got set, right? Nothing starts unless you have that as a priority. And that's what these groups and what everyone here is trying to do in, in some way. But I, I think that it is a challenge and it's hard with this whole upper valley idea of having New Hampshire and Vermont and yet you can come up with ideas about what to do about certain things. But if the systems are very different, it makes that even more challenging. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, well, and I'm just how, how do we, how do we do that? <laughs> I um, I'm relatively new in in my position, so I'm still learning as well. Mm -hmm. um, but for example, you know the substance the, the SMP substance misuse prevention group, they come together on a statewide level as well as meet regionally. So I'm just mm -hmm. I'm trying to see if that also happens with this age group of providers it, it doesn't sounds sound. like it doesn't sound like it does <laughs> and maybe that is a good place to start yeah i janet i just want to say first first of all and, and ruth and everybody i want to say first of all that i do want to acknowledge that it is yes it was lots of dollar dollar bills but but it's not just the money there was a readiness mm -hmm. and a cultural readiness there was expertise there was because you can not every problem can you just throw money at, right? Right, right. So I want I want to acknowledge that because we're no one is saying that out loud yet. I know we all know that, but I'm just gonna say that out loud because sure. that's a really important piece. And I think my experience, and I did live in New Hampshire briefly when I was when I was younger, that there is a cultural difference, um, and there's cultural similarities, and there are cultural differences between the two states. Yeah. And so um, that's important. There's but there's certainly not a lack of expertise in New Hampshire. So. Right. You know, that, you know, the, some, some of the recipe elements are there. I think the other thing is, Emmett, I don't think you were jumping ahead at all. I think one of the most important questions we can ask when we're dealing with a fragmented system is who else is already doing this or something enough like it that I can connect with them. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. That should be the first thing we ask with any idea that we have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I just want to like val validate that that was, that was good instincts <laughs> okay. um, in terms of the, the goals that we're working on here. Um, and yeah, and so I mean, and also, I guess when I think about the upper valley and how there's this, there's a, quite a big difference, like, yes, people move across the river, and it is in a lot of ways, one region and a sort of lived experience kind of way. Um, and, and fiscally, in many ways, it, it is like that. Um, but I almost think of it, I think maybe one of the ways to think of it is that the upper valley isn't just one community. We all know that it's many communities of the upper valley because there are pockets. And one of the diversities of the upper valley is this New Hampshire Vermont distinction. And is so what? as we is the is the Vermont and New Hampshire differences. So so that's a way to approach it in terms of like creativity, I guess, is just it's it's a reframing of the same you know, fact, but it's, you know, how, how can we transfer any kind of knowledge gained in Vermont to New Hampshire and vice versa, frankly? I mean, yeah. Vermont's system is not 100% perfect. Mm -hmm. right. No one should say that. So I just moved so, back. Yeah. I just moved back to New Hampshire after being in Vermont for six years. Mm. Well, and I'd say, and then I think I appreciate, it. let's transition to the, the work plans just for sake of time, um, but kind of a final thought there is that, you know, part the ECEA, and I know Amy's being quiet right now, but the, the design of the ECEA was to kind of bridge that, the divide between New Hampshire and Vermont, and it really spans both states, knowing that some providers live in New Hampshire, but work in Vermont, vice versa, kids, live in New Hampshire, but go to EC settings in Vermont. So, you know, people are crossing the border and how do we ensure those services um, cross with them and those resources cross with them too. Right. So, 
Mm -hmm. Trying to break down some of those silos. Um, so there's lessons, you know, there are some takeaways that, you know, the ECA has already gleaned th through their work over the years that we can continue to build on. Um, okay, should we go to the, what, 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 what work plan should we start with? Should we start with local community maybe? I feel like that's, or... Thoughts? And Andrew, I'll let you share your screen. Okay. And Andrew, will you kind of just give everyone a, a refresher of kind of the goals of this exercise so we can kind of stay on task? <clears throat> yes. Um, I mean, up, up at the top, we've got the common goal of the initiative, um, which is pretty broad. And the goal of this particular work group and the goals of the other work groups just for context. And then um, these were the two, the two goals that came, came out of the, the previous meetings that we've had in terms of working out what we wanna focus on initially here. <clears throat> One was engaging very localized level decision makers like select board members and educating them the use of ARPA money and um, their local infrastructure. So I put, some like action steps. I mean, this is actually a goal. This label isn't, isn't accurate, but um, I put some of the steps I could think of by myself um, for how to make that happen. So one thing that would be helpful is if we could, in order to like realize this goal, come up with more steps, put your name after something, you know, like get stuff um, specific about who's gonna take care of what and by when. Um, that way we can start tra actually tracking progress on these goals. And then a second goal in terms of like engaging local community was to create a town level map of providers. Um, and these goals are related to each other obviously, but for, for localized education and engagement purposes. Um, we mentioned last time that the Carsey School had some kind of, had a, had a bunch of data on this. Um, I'm not sure if it was just for the New Hampshire side or if it was for all of the Upper Valley. Um, but same deal here. These are, these are the steps that I could think of to make this goal happen. So just looking for, for feedback and sort of, you know, who, who wants to do what and by when. And so Andra on that, you know, because I knew we had talked about it, but frankly, I lost where the conversation had happened at. Um, but that creating a list of what our funds could be allocated for, I had collected that data and sent it to somebody and I'm not sure who, but I can retrieve that since the homework has already been accomplished. It's just a matter of my finding um, my sheet on it and forwarding it to whoever I should send it to. Uh, so again, excuse me for not knowing the differences and what's going on. So in um, that first action step or goal, when you're talking about educating people on the, what ARPA can be used for, um, did New Hampshire do something similar in creating like ARPA childcare stabilization grants? I know Andrew's probably heard about what that is, um, but I just didn't know if the state of New Hampshire allocated any of the ARPA funds specifically for childcare and for supporting the childcare system in New Hampshire, or if doing it on the more localized level is um, something that would be more helpful. They pretty much did the exact same thing as Vermont. Okay. The same amount, but they're similar size, similar population, whatever. So they got almost the same amount of money and they use the same amount for um, 
stabilization, you, Vermont's getting it in monthly payments, New Hampshire got it in, in lump sum, that's the only difference. And then okay. where you have individually, they have their rules, which are much uh, looser, but around using the discretionary amount, we neither state really has released what they're doing with exactly with that discretionary amount, but it's very similar as Vermont. As Vermont. Okay. Thank and, you. And, and Ruth, I think that was really important to distinguish between the state level and then with well, there are actually the three levels, there's the state level and then the county level and then the, the, uh, munis the municipal level. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, we probably should note in this that we're talking about on this one, I think we're talking county and municipal because we don't have any um, way to really deal with the state except to keep asking the question like everybody else is about what they're going to do with the discretionary money since they've not been forthcoming in either state with with information about that um, and our earlier conversation about julia reaching out to wendy piper in new hampshire on the county and then tammy had given us a great um um example of a successful strategy in going local on this with her community um the last meeting or the one before um and so i think that's what was encouraging to us was to know that you know one of one of our one of our own has been successful in her town with this so it's it's worth looking at for for other communities so guys this is right up my alley if i'm if i'm going to be um able to be helpful this is you know this is my uh, bailiwick. So what I can offer is I would be more than happy to craft a letter to select boards um, <clears throat> in, in terms of framing the funding request and making a pitch for the, the value of regional collaboration in addressing some of these issues that we've surfaced. That, as I said before, I think it's gonna be key that we come up with a subset of initiatives that we're, we want to pursue with this funding, as well as a recipient for the funding um, for purposes of sort of administering um, the, uh, the distribution of funding for specific elements of an initiative. But once we have a, a plan of action, I'm more than happy to, to draft for everybody to, to ponder and ask. Um, because I see a lot of asks coming in and, I, and I'm used to going out for asks too with my colleague community. So I can offer to help do that. Um, just be advised that my time frame is probably end of June or maybe end of July before I move out. And once I move out, I should, you know, I need to sort of move out and not impinge on my successor. So I'm mindful of that. But if you can make, if we, if the timing works based on my timing, which is selfish, but it's my constraint, I'm happy to, to craft a draft request that could be used generically then for select board A, B, C, both on the Vermont and the New Hampshire side to the extent we're asking across both sides of the river. Okay, so twice now you've mentioned this, and what we need is, is, is that is that content is the is the specifics, and who's who is best to help put that together? Can can we can we help Julia to be able to do what she's offering to us? I mean, I'm looking at Amy. I'm looking at Amy. I'm looking at our our child care resources on the ground. Um, with Audrey to sort of, all right, guys, if we've got half a million dollars to work with or a million, whatever the number is, what, what can we do? So I we, um, Jen Parker and Sean and I got together and we ended up talking about a couple of different things, but one of them was a survey we're sending out. What we need in that, inf out of that survey, what information do we need from centers to craft this plan Ask. that we can together and some of them we, we're going to be asking whether they own or whether they lease is it a triple net lease what does that look like are do they need to get out of their building how much does it cost so that we can start i do know that in new hampshire uh, that the powers that be are 
chattering that they're going to put some of that discretionary money, the ARPA discretionary money, the child care money into buildings, into facilities to purchase and pay down um, their, their yeah. overhead. Mm -hmm. So, so we need to be ready for that. We need to have those numbers ready. So we're going to be, this, this survey is going to be more than just a survey. It's going to be, so if there's anything you think that we might need to, to grab from them, any information to build this, please, you know, put in the chat, let Andrew know, whatever, so that we can figure out a way to grab that all at once in this one survey. Um, we do have a model that COAS built, COAS County built a, um, a, an economic solutions model to childcare that we met and we kind of picked pieces, the major pieces out of those. Um, some of that is legislation that may come back to this group, which is looking at paying for childcare for childcare providers. That is a huge piece. And we were looking at finding money. And one piece is if they didn't have to pay for those slots that their staff use, because they just eat it, they just, just they don't even count it as discounting. Um, if we paid for those slots, if we, um, we go to enrollment based in New Hampshire, they're going to be capturing some money. If we make sure that they have a strong, um, a strong, uh, a strong business uh, plan and and structure, they're going to be full collection. So we're going to be finding money within the center, as well uh, to go toward wages, of course, which could go toward wages, but also kind of being prepped for what the ideas that the states have. So once Vermont starts releasing, giving us some ideas, Ruth, if you've heard any tricklings of what Vermont might be using, we could be gathering data and putting that into our plan so that we can plug the funding into the plan. Oops, sorry. I'm talking about me. Um, this is Deli. Is anyone working with Marianne Barter? Um, I know she's going to be, you are, okay. So I, I'm not sure if you guys are up to date on Senate Bill 446. Do you want a quick update? Is that a yes or a no? I can't tell. <laughs> I can't tell. Yes or no on 446? Yeah, go, go, go ahead. On. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So uh, the premise of 446 was to ask for $9 million of ARPA funding to go directly back to uh, child care organizations to do with it what they wanted. And the bill was amended three times and did finally pass five nothing out of committee. It's going next Thursday to the Senate floor to be voted on. Uh, but the bill no longer um, asks that that $9 million be um, given out legislatively. It's now going to Chris Antonello's department and uh, Marianne Barter's group is gonna work with her on the plan to distribute that $9 million. So I think if you guys have thoughts about how you'd like that spent, I think meeting with Marianne might make the most sense. My, that's my two cents. Thanks. That's helpful insight. But can I, Amy, what's your sense on the timeline and Julia too about getting, you know, what's our window for both at the municipal level and then at the statewide level to get some specifics in front of decision makers about allocations? My, my sense is, Brooke, that um, Communities got their first half of their money last August. They get the second half of their money this coming August. Once that second tranche comes in, that, that sort of is an important milestone in terms of everybody having everything set aside. And particularly because so many of our towns are on a January 1 to, to December 31st fiscal year, the, the fall is budget planning for them in terms of um, the calendar year 2023 budget year. So, so a, you know, a September timeframe or even earlier is not a bad target to aim for. Summer is always a little sketchy because 
board members, like everybody else, are in and out of town for family gatherings and vacations. But boy, everything picks up again in September. And particularly for towns with a January 1 through December 31st calendar fiscal year and March town meetings. They don't need to get town meeting authorization to spend their ARPA money. So the select boards have the authority to accept that grant money and, and expend it. But a lot of towns are gonna wanna check in with their residents before they start spending that money because it's, you know, it's a big sum. So anytime, anytime this summer is fine, but just know that come September, I think you're gonna see a rush of energy around, okay, now that we have all our ARPA money in house, what shall we do with it? And by then, hopefully the, the clear opportunities that, that exist in the, in the federal infrastructure bill will be clear enough that we'll all know, okay, do we wanna use that ARPA money for something we're applying for, for the infrastructure bill funding? Or, or can we now assume that, that, um, that ARPA money can work for other projects and not infrastructure bill related projects? Thank you, that's helpful. And then kind of thinking about the frame, you know, we're the advocacy work group. So technically our spot is not kind of in the weeds drafting those recommendations, but want to be supportive of the work groups and those who are. Um, so kind of looking to you, Amy, and letting us know what you need and how we can be a resource and then how we can kind of spread the word to support those recommendations and get get it in front of municipalities and, and really business coalitions too to um, to sign on and support even even the college, Dartmouth College. So just kind of thinking about once we have those recommendations kind of in hand, us as the advocacy work group kind of springing into action to get others to to buy in and um, and get behind it. I wonder too, I didn't get a chance to look in detail at the recommendations in the Let's Grow Kids letter about the governor's proclamation, but I wonder if there's anything in there that might either spark a bigger idea or that could go into this letter. Um, because I know that that information was garnered, you know, through throughout Vermont, um, throughout this region anyway, because it was from the family place, um, as well as Vasey, as well as Let's Grow Kids. So. Just an idea there, there's because there was a lot on that list. You know, another thing to think about, um, Amy, I'm, I'm, and and Brooke, I'm, th and Audra, I'm thinking about this from a timing perspective. Um, an alternate approach that acknowledges that you don't want to rush to make some decisions about what needs to be funded with this money. You you want time to plan thoughtfully with plenty of input from your childcare provider community. But if you were to create a fund, essentially, a regional fund for which you're seeking community ARPA monies to, to, um, to be added to that fund that, that would be overseen or administered by an entity that, that folks know, understand and recognize has a far better sense of what's needed than an individual group of select board members or city councilors might. That's an that's an another approach here. And then it's all about, okay, what 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 does this entity look like? Who sits on that in that group that's helping to disperse those funds? And so that's just that's kind of a. Um, an interim approach, I guess, that buys everybody time to really do this thoughtfully. And, and that sometimes just requires some time. Um, and you're not rushing to gather data. You're not rushing to arrive at conclusions, seek funding for it, and then decide, wait a minute, that's not what makes the most sense. So then it's all about having a really thoughtful entity or group of entities that are gonna be allocating the monies as the needs are um, fully identified and finalized. Yeah, I like that that thought. And I mean, the ECEA is an entity, the vital communities. Right, exactly. Um, 
exactly. Um, or group you know, as an entity. So those kind of exist and just making the case for outlining kind of the work plan. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm thinking of the work that Clay Adams and the and the corporate council are doing to create this $10 million fund to essentially work with Evernorth on the construction of more workforce housing. And, and they haven't asked municipalities for ARPA funds, but I suggested to Clay they very well could because boy, that's a that's a very tangible effort to help unleash the construction of more workforce housing. So that, you know, as we were sitting here and I was thinking about timeline, I realized you don't want to jam this artificially just for the sake of scoring that ARPA money when in fact what you could do is just sell a very thoughtful process going forward that deserves some local financial support. Um, other, yeah, go ahead. So this is just a, a question. I'm, I'm curious. Do we know if that's actually an, an allowable use of the funds? Can can ARPA funds be directed into a uh, another fund that's then managed by a, a third party entity? That's, that's so long as it's spent by the deadline. Right, so Michael. As, yeah. yeah. For any community receiving under ten million dollars, which is basically yeah. every community in the Upper Valley. There are, yeah. there are just absolutely no strings attached. Yeah. The federal but, but government would, finally said, just guys, do what you need to do. We we trust you. If you're getting more okay. than $10 million, you're you're, you know, like your Manchester, you've got more accountability. But but the smaller right. allocations, they just wanted to do good works. Okay. And and I so in municipalities, there's a there's a time limit on those funds, right? They need to be expended, they'll need to be expended by a certain time. But if they're moved into a fund, could that fund then have a time horizon that's longer than the no, no, they, you know, okay. The government wants to get this money in the pipeline and not yeah. sitting somewhere. So you yeah. would you would still um have to to be sure that your um your funds are are expended by the by the deadline, uh, yeah. but there's a lot of flexibility. And what is the deadline? December thirty first of twenty twenty six. Six. It ha yeah, which means that essentially for the bookkeeping purposes, it's really got to be out there by September of 26 in order to get the paperwork done by December of 26. Great. Okay. Well, I, I feel I feel good about some action steps around that line of work. And that's a little a bit of a broader timeline are there more immediate short-term community needs that this advocacy group could weigh in on to kind of help with the uh, the immediate staffing shortages crisis i know we, we talked about week of the young child and some to do's there but are there other other ways we can lean in locally in the short term I mean, one of the things that came up uh, in our, the staff R3 committee is that they're losing their after school care, which means that child care providers are losing, can't work because their after school care is, is struggling. So I did talk to Sean because it was, um, I think it's a Lebanon recreation group that's struggling. And they they're already on it with Boys and Girls Club, Chris and with that whole contact. So I wanted to kind of give them space there a little bit to get the Coniston piece kind of not, you know, it's supposed to close actually next Friday. Um, I don't know if they're going to be able to save it by then, but they're working really hard to. I'm wondering if there's any way just for now, as we're staring down the summer, um, an April vacation, if there's any way to 
um, pull together, you know, I'm thinking of these people, I'm hearing, I'm not from Upper Valley, but I hear that like this Chad event is huge. It's like, it's a big deal. There's tons of people that come out of the woodwork support when there's an event. We have it locally too. I'm wondering if there's any way to do some sort of volunteer-ish where people can take a day a week and work in an after-school program, um, maybe eventually work in an after-school program or some sort of like big Chad kind of level effort to, to shore up after-school programs for now. Um, it, it seems like there's space. You know, we're hearing in school districts that they have a space or they can be sort of worked with to have a space so that overhead costs could be controlled a little bit better, but it's the staffing. And so I worked with Jen Parker a little bit on this and it takes one person as a group leader um, and they, get, they need a free, at least three credits in early childhood education. They're the group leader. They can oversee 45 kids not by themselves, but over, oversee the group of 45 and the ratio is one to 15. But the people working with the one to 15 can be a high school student, can be a college student, can be a volunteer who has a criminal background check and CPR first aid. So I, it, it's not a humongous deal. Like childcare is a lot more restricted when you get under school age. Um, as far as training and prep and all that, but after school seems like maybe we could, we could join together and come up with some sort of a, a some, some way to save it <laughs> because everybody's going to be out of work before long. I, I heard that this is the third after school program to close in just a short time. I, I'm getting emails from parents in Enfield that they're going to lose their job if they don't if they don't get after school and summer care. And Amy, we just we just had to, Hanover runs an after school program in our elementary school. We just had to notify all our parents that effective April 1st, we're having to reduce the size of our program because we can't find enough uh, staff. And this is with our, our full-time parks and recreation staff who have other jobs working every shift um, to cover the lack of staff. So it's a, it's a crisis, guys, and it's gonna. I think it, it. The worry is it's going to extend in, into the summer playground, summer day camp um, season, uh, and we we okay. even pursued the Hampshire Cooperative Nursery School approach of hey, if every parent could work one afternoon a month, one a month, that's it, uh, and you know not a whole lot of interest. They want us to save the program, but you, you just can't find the volunteers or we'll pay them. <laughs> Heck, but. I think the after school programs on the Vermont side are struggling as well. I hear that often. Um, and so I know that's one area that sounds like a really good idea to kind of support that. Um, along those same lines, I would say one thing on an operational level that would really be helpful, and I've said this to all the parties and agencies in Vermont, and I know they've worked on it before, but they haven't quite gotten it to the finish line, is working on a vetted pool of substitutes that in an area, all the child care centers could call upon if they can't cover with their own staff that would people who are background checked and fingerprinted and could do that. And like you said, it would take, maybe somebody says, well, I can only do it once a month or I can only do it twice a year, whatever it is. But having that would be hugely beneficial because there are just times when I know in my center, I am primarily the only substitute <laughs> and I can only cover for one person at a time. So there's this constant level of stress that exists and a constant level of overwhelm and burnout for the teachers who are covering for everybody else. 
but it would just be nice. And I know every place is struggling. The school systems can't find substitutes, but it would be nice if there was even some small steps towards making that a reality. And so it kind of goes along with that idea of how to support the after school and summer programs, because it's the same thing. We don't need people who say, I want to leave my career and go do this. We just need people who say, okay, I'm willing to work a couple of days a year, you know, and how do you promote that enough to make it something that everyone knows exists? You know, it, it reminds me of when they have like the volunteer day where everybody like tries to take a day and volunteer for their favorite organization. How do we make child, those elements of what supports childcare part of that kind of initiative? I think the problem we're dealing with right now, guys, is that, um, and, and we, in the past, we've coined the kid care core that would be available on short notice to step in like subs and schools. But most of those folks are retirees and COVID has got them understandably anxious about spending a whole lot of time with youngsters. So this problem that we're facing right now has, as we all know, been substantially impacted by COVID concerns. Um, and whether you're trying to hire teens from your high school to work in an after-school program or look for local volunteers, many of whom are probably seniors or retirees, um, COVID continues to be the underlying barrier. I would agree. I would say that um, one thing that I've done was reach out to, because I don't know what the regulations are in New Hampshire, but in Vermont, for like a high school student to come and work, they have to, um, if they're under 18, they have to be in an established um, health services program in their school. So I've asked our licensors to talk about how do we have the ability to hire some, a child who's perhaps on a, a different college career track in high school, not looking to go into human services, but is willing for the summer to work in a child care center. Um, and so they're, they said that they're, they got a couple calls <laughs> for variances to try to get this to work. So it's that kind of thinking of, okay, we, we have these regulations that say we can only hire these types of um, high school kids who are in a specific track. How do we make that easier? So, I mean, honestly, me as a director, if I have a kid who's planning to go into medicine, and but in the summer until they graduate high school would love to come and work with the kids, I want, those I want those kids to come work for me. But right now there's a barrier to that. So I'm wondering, are there similar barriers on, in New Hampshire to hiring based on age and training? And, and for that example, Ruth, is that something that needs to change legislatively or is that a regulation change? And that's kind of where advocacy can be helpful and when it's not just you asking your licensor mm -hmm. there's a collective and, and we can help kind of bring the collective. Right. So like I asked how would I go about applying for a variance to this regulation to hire somebody because I have somebody to hire and I want to support so that I can actually have more preschoolers in my summer program because I have siblings of younger kids and that sort of thing. And I'm trying to meet the needs because I have a wait list. And so I asked that question and the licensor basically said, I don't think we've ever had anyone ask for a variance for that. Well, we're in a crisis. Now is the time to think about how do we just make that easier? So they're working on it, but it, it takes somebody asking the question like, I can do this. I could find people. I, I may not know any kids who are in the human services programs. I may not even and, know how and to access by the them. Way, and by the way, they've cut them back so significantly in their focus that it's irrelevant to this, to, you know, the, the, the requirement no longer right. fits what's going on at the tech center. So it's right. stupid. Besides, right. so it's just, besides being a burden, it's stupid. Right. So it, doesn't, right. it has I no meaning. That, 
I think it's like, it's helpful for those of us who also work on the operational side of it to look at, well, what are those barriers? Who could we be hiring that we're not able to hire for whatever reason? So for me, that was a big one. It's like, honestly, if they said to me, you can hire people, you know, in the summer that, that aren't in any specific program, I would be contacting the local high school and seeing who, how many people I could hire, you know, but it's those kinds of things that I think that didn't used to be a regulation, but then it became one. <laughs> and right now it just doesn't make sense. So I, I just wondered if there are similar things that might um, free up some people to work in New Hampshire is to support like the after school programs and the summer programs. I appreciate you highlighting that. And I, I wanna be mindful of time and I, um, we'll wrap up. I wanna note Tammy's, um, what she suggests in the chat, kind of retired ECE um, teachers and, and pooling them. And I just like, I think as we kind of gather these, these lists and these ideas, and then we can kind of help mobilize around it or develop a plan to help mobilize around it and what action steps need to be taken. Um, yeah, so. it would, that's, that's a great idea. Tammy's idea is great. I just, am, and most of my teachers, when they retire, I keep them as subs <laughs> if I possibly can. But I wonder if there's a way on a state level to get a list of everyone who retired fairly recently to be able to reach out to those people and say, hey, would you be willing to work part-time? Would you be willing to work in an after-school program? Whatever that is. But you can't really um, do that efficiently if you can't really target it to the right people. So I wondered if there's a way, like, cause all that for in Vermont, all that's in the Bright Futures in the BFIS system. Um, I wonder if there's a way to get that data. Yeah, I don't know that answer. And usually we have someone from Vermont, let's grow kids on this call, but that's something we can keep on the, the radar. And is there a system like that in New Hampshire that kind of where all of your, all the people working in child care, all of your credentials are kept and that sort of thing? Do you have a system that maybe also there could be a list? Yeah, none of that is you're not able to share because it's attached to so much other information. And then, mm -hmm. and, and the, you know, <coughs> school teachers in Vermont need the same list. They want to access the people that are licensed. Um, but if we had a campaign like during COVID where they said, hey, if you have it, if you've taught in the yeah. past, can you come forward? If you're a nurse and you're retired, <laughs> like, and then voluntarily, uh, you know, put go into this clearinghouse, then we would have that information. So I think that's what we need to do is like pitch this need almost like a COVID we're at war, like we have got to get, get people into programs to keep them open, keep people mm -hmm. at work. But the other thing, if money's not the, the worst issue, then can we pay, give them free after school care if they volunteer for the after school program? Because it, it, you struggle to volunteer and have to pay for it. So if we can pay for them, if you're a volunteer, you get free child care, uh, free after school care too. So there's like a lot of things that this could be um, and there is some legislation I think that could, needs to happen to help keep this from being an issue. Great. I unfortunately I'm going to wrap us up here just because we're over time. Um, any last final thoughts, there? Do you want to say anything, or just just waving goodbye, agreeing with me? <laughs> okay. Um, I really appreciate the conversation today and everybody's insights and inputs. And I think we have some good action steps um, and, and takeaways. I'm really grateful for your, for your time today. Um, this is a good conversation. All right. Thanks.